Okay, recording started. So please, it's your floor. Okay, thanks, Gabriella. It's your floor. Thanks very much okay. for joining us today, everybody. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? No problems there? You can see my screen? Okay. Thank you very much. Good, good, good. <clears throat> yes, I, I'm Colin Rundle. I'm the uh, Assistant Director of the World Language Centre, the WLC at uh, Soka University. We're on the outskirts of Tokyo in Hachioji. So uh, I'm, I and my colleagues, uh, Tetsuko and Koki, uh, will be uh, talking to you today about the project that we began uh, last year. <clears throat> to align our um, English programs with the uh, CEPA. So um, like everything else, we're not as far into it as we would like to be because 2020 happened, uh, but we'll report to you what we've, uh, what we've been doing so far. And our, our number one objective in today's presentation is actually to get your input, to uh, get your advice and let us know um, what we might have done correctly and some things that we should be doing that we haven't done and and to uh, actually suggest some future directions for us actually. So your participation is really important to us today. So I'll begin um, um, by telling you, I'll begin by trying to move my PowerPoint slides. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to begin by giving you an overview of the project and uh, what we've been doing so far. And then Tetsuko and Koki are going to um, share the results of a pilot needs analysis that we did uh, at the end of last year. And we've just kind of um, analysed it now, actually, and we're about to implement a, a second needs analysis. <clears throat> so we'd really appreciate your input into that as well. And then we'll be um, asking you for your input at the end. But if you want to um, put in any questions into the chat or, or stop me if there's something you don't understand as we go along, um, please feel free to do that. Um, so yeah, I'll talk about the World Language Centre. Uh, very quickly, the rationale for doing this uh, CEPHRA alignment. And then I'll talk about how we've been implementing it so far. And as I said, we'll get on to the pilot needs analysis. So um, <clears throat> the World Language Centre, you can see the photograph there on this slide. It's a, a beautiful new facility that we've got at Soka University uh, there. So we're not that whole building, but um, we uh, occupy uh, the eighth floor and uh, a lot of the fifth floor rooms and a lot of the second floor in that building. So we, we're a World Language Centre, so we're not a faculty. So we provide um, the basic English communication courses for most of the faculties at uh, Soka University. Uh, <clears throat> so there's uh, been a, a trend towards uh, some of the faculties establishing their own English program. So our, our uh, role is changing a little, uh, has been changing over the last few years. <clears throat> but basically all of the students at Soka University regardless of their major, need to get six credits uh, of English uh, in order to graduate. So um, we at the WLC particularly focus on the first year uh, that the students are at the university. And we provide uh, English one and two, which is the first semester and second semester compulsory English courses. So the students get four credits when they've completed that first year of uh, English communication. So that leaves only um, two more credits for them uh, until they don't have to study English anymore. So we actually lose a lot of the students after the first year. Uh, we've got second year courses, English three and four, um, but there's also a lot of other options that the students can, can take advantage of to get their remaining two credits. So they can, get, um, they can get their credits through study abroad programs. They can participate in University of the Air, uh, what's that, Hoso Daigaku, um, and take other various courses and uh, internships and things like that. So we actually lose a lot of the students in the second year, which is a, a bit of a challenge for us. 
Um, we also run a few ESP courses for the faculties. Uh, as I mentioned, that's uh, becoming less and less every year. Uh, we have a very big self-access center and we're, we're in the process of developing that um, at the moment as well. So that's, that's gonna be one of the major future directions of our CEFA alignment is to uh, bring in the CEFA into the self-access center. And uh, we've actually got our own WLC study abroad program now, which started last year, actually. So that's another uh, option, uh, opportunity to implement uh, CEFA into. So that's basically the World Language Centre. Uh, this, this is how we um, grade our, our courses. So um, the first year and the second year English courses are streamed into A, B, C and D levels and you can see that we've used TOEIC traditionally um, so basically all, all of our um, leveling of students uh, and the university is quite uh, infatuated with TOEIC scores uh, as you might imagine um, especially since we've become part of the super global uh, project for the last several years so there's actually TOEIC uh, benchmarks that students are hoped to achieve uh, but you can see the levels there for A, our lowest level, up to D, the highest level. Uh, and as we began this alignment uh, project, uh, we had a lot of discussion uh, about which version of CEFA to use uh, and how to level, how to get the equivalencies be be between um, TOEIC and the CEFA. So we decided basically that the A level would be taking those very low level students from the threshold of, uh, across the threshold from A1 to A2, introducing them to A2 um, skills. And B basically is very focused on the A2 level. Uh, and C we've imagined uh, taking the students from an A2 into a B, B1 level, introducing them to B1 um, can-do statements, uh, descriptors. And for the D level, we've got a very, we've got a very um, large range of students like returnees, that type of thing, high proficiency Japanese students, but we've got more and more international students as well. Uh, as I said, uh, re related to the super global project that we're involved in. So the D level has a, a very wide variety of abilities. So yeah, we basically though, we've, we've um, settled on B1 to B2 as the, the target uh, levels for D. Um, so yeah, this is mostly in English one, but also applies to English two. Okay. Uh, so, so now uh, I'll just talk about the rationale for CEFR alignment. So this is nothing particularly original here. I think most of you here are are very familiar with the CEFA literature, I think, so you probably understand most of this. Um, but I think in, in the WLC, since I've been there, I've been there for eight years now, and I think we've had many changes, but there was no real overarching framework uh, for a lot of the changes and a lot of the courses we were offering. It was often a bit unclear about you know, why we're offering certain courses and what how the courses differed one from the other. Um, so really it's a good opportunity applying um, CEFA to our, our programs uh, to standardize our objectives and outcomes there. So yeah, we've got a lot of um, courses and a lot of uh, students that we're dealing with. Um, so we've got in first year, we, we've got over a thousand students uh, enrolled in the English one, two, for example, um, we've got uh, uh, over 50 teachers that we're um, coordinating as well. So it's good to have this standardization there. Um, and like I said, there's the self access center is a, a separate program, the study abroad program. Then we've got the faculty based English courses. So there's so many different courses. So having this one framework in which to um, compare them all uh, and uh, set our objectives is really useful. Uh, and another thing that has been really important, I think, with this uh, alignment project is actually having a focus to bring all of the teachers together. 
which is something we hadn't really done uh, very much, where teachers come together and discuss their courses and, and uh, talk about what they do in their class and what their objectives are in the class and uh, what their students are like, that type of thing. Um, so the, we've had three workshops so far with the CEPHRA alignment. And I think that's been a really uh, a good aspect is having, having the teachers working together. And you can see that it develops a lot of dynamism, dynamism and enthusiasm amongst the teachers, I think. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of sharing going on with materials and activities, uh, uh, or starting anyway. So that's been very good. Um, clear statements of goals and achievements, again, at the course level and for different levels. Um, we've been able to differentiate that quite a bit and the shared criteria for assessment by teachers and learners. So that's something we really want to move towards is, um, is uh, students taking control of their own learning. Uh, we're very, very much uh, invested in uh, developing student autonomy. And I think CEPHRA is uh, going to be a great uh, move ahead for the WLC in that regard. And also we're hoping that this is going to carry on with the students through their uh, lifelong learning engagement with uh, English and the CEPHRA will be something that they can take with them after they've uh, finished studying at WLC. Um, so I'll move on to the basic approach which we've been adopting. So, um, you know, a lot of it comes from the literature that the, the CEPHRA the SIG has, uh, has published. So we're very thankful for that. Um, and also the, the North publications there, we've been getting a lot of ideas from that. So it's very clear that we wanna adopt as much as possible a, a bottom-up approach. But of course, there's a contradiction that this, you know, this has been uh, uh, initiated by um, me and the director of the WLC. So there's obviously a top-down approach to it. So uh, I think the idea where we need some firm leadership and some you know, definite top-down uh, impetus and leadership to carry the program forward is very important. But uh, the idea of having bottom-up teacher input is uh, absolutely crucial, of course, because uh, none of these uh, uh, curriculum reform pro projects are ever going to work if uh, teachers aren't invested and involved in it as much as possible. Um, and also this idea about the incremental approach seems to be very important, uh, I think. Um, one reason is I'm very busy and <laughs> probably don't have as much time as I should to uh, invest in it. So we're taking it, you know, step by step, quite slowly. And very important at the beginning, at least, is to don't throw out the existing syllabus. So that they've been in place for quite a, a long time. The teachers have been very happy teaching uh, the syllabus up to date. Um, so we definitely don't need a major overhaul. So um, we're trying to build on what we've already got rather than uh, have a very radical, um, what's that, you know, reconfiguration. Uh, so yeah, we would really want to develop and add to and support uh, a lot of the things that we've been doing in the past, rather than have a radical break from the past. So I've shamelessly just stolen this uh, diagram uh, from Gabriella and uh, a lot of the other people here. Um, I think th this, this kind of idea is also very important for bringing the teachers along and making sure that everybody is on board and knows what's going on. So the, the few workshops we began with uh, developing understanding uh, amongst the full-time teachers in particular. Um, we've introduced it to part-time teachers but haven't quite brought them on board yet, but that's part of the next step. Uh, developing resources, again, we're at the very early stage of that, but I'll, I'll show you some of the things that we've been using and uh, if you've got any other resources to suggest, we would love to hear about that. Um, training, I don't think we're at the training stage yet. Um, but yeah, as we move forward and get uh, into more detailed areas of developing the syllabi in alignment with CEPHA, we'll, we'll do a lot more training. And hopefully I'll be able to bring in a lot of the, um, the leaders of the CEPHA SIG 
to come to Soka University and lead some training sessions. Uh, that's one idea we want to carry ahead with. Um, so we've basically been using this um, process that North um, has uh, described in his book where we've talked about the school philosophy that wasn't as easy as I thought it might be to try and get teachers on board um, to ha have a, a common starting point with what we're achieving. Uh, we've, we've moved ahead and got some clarity on the objectives in various courses. Maybe we're not talking too much about methods yet, but we have produced some syllabus, uh, syllabi that I'm going to show you. And assessment is definitely a next step for us to think about. Okay, um, so these are implementation modalities. This is what we've been trying to, to do, or this is actually what we've been doing. Uh, so we've had uh, workshops with the teachers. Um, we've conducted one pilot survey with the students. We haven't actually done surveys with the teachers yet, but that's something uh, that we will be doing in the future. And we've started to develop some planning documents. So centre philosophy exists. We're still working on that to put it more into a, a teacher friendly mode. We've got a very top down university idea of what, a, what the WLC philosophy is, but we need to bring some teacher voices into that still. Um, course descriptions is basically what the um, WLC gives to the teachers. Um, to guide them in designing their own syllabi. So we've actually already started um, issuing course descriptions in, in CEPA format. Um, and the teachers, this year we were planning to get them to produce their syllabi using CEPA can do statements, um, illustrative descriptors, but uh, we didn't quite make it there. And then we want to start um, producing lesson plans that teachers can share. So they're the things that the documents that we're working on at the moment, working towards. So this is what we've actually done so far, the timeline. So you can see we started in spring 2019 and we go up to February 2020. And that's about where the pandemic started. So spring 2020, fall 2020 is there in red. So uh, we haven't actually, we didn't actually get around to doing them, but, uh, but we will be planning to do some workshops uh, before the end of this year, actually. So we're, we're, we basically didn't do anything last semester. So we'll be getting started on that again. Um, so I will, I've got uh, more detailed slides on each workshop. So I think I will just go through now to the workshops there. So this was the first workshop done in the spring uh, last year, July. And this was quite, kind of a failure. So it was a learning experience. Uh, we just introduced um, the CEPHER alignment project, gave the rationale, uh, explained it to teachers and wanted to get some input from the teachers. Um, so, the first mistake was that it was just one of the um, standard programmed professional development sessions that we have, and it wasn't compulsory. So I had um, seven out of, uh, what is it, 28 teachers turned up. So in that regard, yeah, it didn't achieve what we wanted it to achieve. Um, so we decided that we need um, compulsory workshops for this. And that was a bit of a cultural change. We've been fairly hands off in terms of forcing teachers to do things in the past. But um, yeah, we, we want to want this to succeed and we want everybody involved in it. So we, we need to have compulsory workshops, of course. Um, and we needed to develop some tools. So we needed to make the um, illustrative descriptors or the can do statements uh, available in a, in a user friendly uh, uh, format for the teachers and uh, using posters was one of the ideas we had for that. Um, so let me move on to the second workshop. So we made this one a compulsory workshop in October uh, last year. Um, so it basically had very similar objectives to the first workshop that didn't really get off the ground. Um, 
and we wanted to really discuss what were the core objectives and activities in our English 1 to 4, but you know, we're still focusing mostly on English 1 to 2, which is the focus of this presentation. Um, and yeah, very basically, you know, the main issue to talk about was uh, whether we were, which courses we're going to focus on CALP and VICS. So this basically academic English and um, daily communication skills uh, in English. So that's a very basic issue, uh, but it hadn't really been um, nailed down in any way in the last several years at the WLC. So um, I think we got everybody on board in this meeting. So the outcomes were definitely an understanding. Teachers, some teachers had very basic understanding, but we, we started to develop an understanding and appreciation of SEPA in this meeting. Um, the mission and, and strengths of the WLC, well, this wasn't exactly what I was looking for, but it was good that, you know, teachers said, you know, that it's a nice place to work everybody's friendly, we, we can cooperate. So, okay, that's good. That was a great start for, you know, what, what's the strengths of the WLC and the philosophy, if you like, maybe. Um, but we still need to work on that. But I think it was very important to have this discussion about are our courses academic English or, you know, daily English, basically. So we came up with this idea that the, the very basic level, the A level, should be just daily communication, of course. And then we can move into level B, where the, the students already have some communicative ability, and we can be introducing them to, to academic uh, English and skills as well. C level are very competent, quite competent in their English ability, so we can probably introduce more academic English there, um, more review to study abroad and travel abroad for those students and the D students, yeah, we, we wanted to focus on academic English for them because they should be able to achieve in academic environments. Uh, you'll see later when we did the pilot study that students have very different ideas about that. Uh, but I'll let Koki and Tetsuko talk about that. Um, then in the third workshop, again, that was compulsory. And we actually were, uh, we wanted to clarify and agree on the course objectives for English 1 and 2, and then look more specifically at the can do statements, the illustrative descriptors, and identify core and non core syllabus content. Uh, and to do that, I, like I said, we wanted to not make a radical departure from what we've been doing before, but build on what we've been doing before. So the first step here was for me to take our existing course descriptions and basically trans translate them into the CEFA um, vernacular, into the can-do statement forms of CEFA, uh, and then present that to the teachers and let them look through those particular statements and then decide what they wanted to keep, what they wanted to change, and what they wanted to, to get rid of. And... Um, yeah, I think that was reasonably successful. We, we did that quite well, I think. And we created, created a first draft of what North calls the syllabi, but we call that the course description at the WLC. Um, so this was one of the tools. So this was what we used in the third workshop. Um, so like I said before, so many can do statements and it's quite difficult getting teachers to um, to have an understanding of what the statements are, the can-do statements. So Kolke, um did a nice job of using Google, Google Forms, was it? Um, and made, uh, made this nice clickable links uh, 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 where he basically put um, all of the descriptors online and we could click through to see uh, all the descriptors in various categories. Uh, he also sent out a, um, uh, what was that? It was like a log sheet where teachers could uh, keep a record of what they were doing in their class and try and find the, uh, the illustrative descriptors that they were addressing in each of their classes. So they could do that for like two months leading up to the third workshop and they could bring that to the workshop to discuss. Uh, I'm not sure that many teachers actually did do that. 
because uh, it involved uh, quite a uh, an investment from them to do that. But some of them did, and it was a good resource for them. Uh, you can see I've got a link at the bottom here. If you've got the PDF that I shared, uh, you'll be able to click on that link, and you, it'll take you to this um, uh, can-do reference that Koki made on uh, on his Gmail drive. It's on on our Gmail drive actually. Um, what was the, uh, this, this is just a, a quick slide of the um, course descriptions that we used to just have written in our own format, but I've changed this and I, for each of the four skills, I've added um, uh, CEPA descriptors there. I've replaced what, I translated what we had in our original course descriptions and translated it into um, into CEPA can do statements there. So we've got the general description and objective at the top. I'll show you that in detail, how that was changed uh, in the meeting. I think there's a link, yeah, I've got a link here later on if you want to look at the, um, the course descriptions that we produced at the end of this workshop, you can, you can click through and take a look at them as well. Um, this, this was like a poster one of the posters that I made up again, <clears throat> we did this workshop in a classroom uh, at the university. And so I had like, what was it, about six or seven of these sheets with all of the can do statements on them and basically posted them all around the room. So we divided the, the teachers up into the levels that they mostly taught. So we had English one, two teachers, you know, all the A level teachers workshopped the course descriptions and the B level. C level, D level teachers all worked on, on what they wanted to do in their course, what they actually did do in their course, and, uh, and looked at the can do statements that um, that correspond with what they actually did in their classes. Uh, and you could see this. This is a close up of, of one of those uh, posters where the teachers have workshopped the different can do statements and, and made notes in the statements that they want included in the course descriptions as uh, as the core content of the course. Um, <clears throat> and they actually uh, workshopped this a bit more. They came back and then put their preferences on uh, posters. So this was a poster for A-level courses there. Um, and you could see how they've written down that there's cross-referenced uh, with the white sheet there. That's the actual course description that was translated into basic CEPA um, can do statements. And then they've annotated that for changes that they want to make uh, on, the, on the course description. This is a close up here. Uh, so this is some of the reading descriptors that the teachers wanted to keep in the basic course description. Uh, these guys did a good job. This was one thing we wanted to do at this meeting, but it was obviously a step too far because, um, uh, what was that? Um, we, we wanted the teachers to modify the can do statement. So you can see here that, uh, uh, the, these teachers have translated very short into 100 to 200 words. So things like that is very good, but we need to do that much more in the next steps. And so the basic outcomes, this is basically what I said before. We got the A-level course was focused on daily English. B-level course was mostly daily English with some academic English. C-level course was mostly academic with some daily English. And the D-level D is not there. But uh, this is the link to the course descriptions that we actually produced in the end. If you've got the PDF, you can click through that. Um, so next is Koki and Tetsuko uh, going to explain about the um, uh, pilot survey that we did, which is um, what North calls a global needs analysis. So um, this, this uh, wasn't done in, in CEPA can do format yet, but it was much more basic than that. Just, uh, and uh, so I'll leave this to Tetsuko and Koki to go through. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. I am going to take over from now and um, talk about the needs analysis data. So as Colin introduced, this questionnaire was conducted in 
the year 2020, uh, 2019. And we are going to show the data focusing on the five things that's on the slide. I'm going to introduce the first three points, response rates, preferred focus of English, and a little bit about current classroom activities. Okay, moving on to slide 21. Colin? Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's me. Uh, there we go. Okay, so this is a slide that shows the response rates by faculties. There are a lot of numbers, so I'm going to walk you through this. So as you can see, the data was collected by five faculties, education, law, science, nursing, and letters. 1,031 students were registered on record but, um, according to the Academic Affairs Office. And for this study, 430 students responded. So that will be 42% of the students uh, registered for English 2, which is a second semester freshman English. When we look at the participants by the faculty, which is the very bottom numbers and the row which is blue. Um, students from the letters, 27% was the highest participants by faculty and 25% was by science students and 23% of the students were from law. Okay, slide 22. Now we'll look at the participants by the level. So as Colin introduced, we have English one and two offered in four different levels, A, B, C, and D. First row shows how many students were registered on the record by, um, based on the academic affairs uh, record. And the second row shows participants for this study. So the total numbers will be the same and the response rates are about 42%. As you can see, students from the B levels was the majority, but it's pretty much the same as level A students, which is 31%. So level D students, we only had 5.6% in this study. So when we talk about the data, sometimes we exclude level D students because of the participants rates. Okay, let's move on to slide 23. I would like to touch down on one of the findings as a result. So here the title says preferred focus of English. Um, on the questionnaire, the question says, what do you want to study in your English class? The data is sorted based on their levels and on the far right, you see the mean uh, scores across levels. Okay, as you can see, surprisingly, majority of students reported that they want to study daily English. Colleen, can you click that? Yeah. And as you can see, level D students, 100% of level D students reported that they want to study daily English. But as you remember, level D students are the highest level students, which is TOEIC over 480. So we were quite taken aback. And second popular choice was test prep. In the questionnaire, we listed major tests for example, TOEFL, IBT, IELTS, TOEIC, so on and so forth. And by looking at the mean score, more than 50, no, not the mean score, but when we look at level B students, more than 50% of them reported that they want to study English, especially for the test preparation. This is another interesting finding. Okay, moving on to, Slide 24. 
Next, we asked students, um, how much were you able to practice four skills in your class? Let's look at the receptive skills first. So listening and reading. As you can see on the slide where there is green boxes, A and B level students had similar trends. And when we ran ANOVA, they showed identical results. Colin? But when we look at the C level results, where it's uh, highlighted in light blue, um, they reported where you look at the orange and red color sections, many students said that it was much or too much. So that's a different trend than level A and level B students. Let's move on to the intensity of productive skills, speaking and writing. Okay, on the left side where it shows the speaking skills, A and B level students, more than 40 of them said that the practice was appropriate. However, when we look at the C level students response, many students responded that the speaking practice was too much. You can see that by looking at the orange and red color sections. Moving on to the writing, across all levels, more than 40% of students reported that the practice was appropriate. And when we focus on level C for writing, um, they had the highest reporting for much, which is the orange color. Now we're going to move on to the uh, classroom activity. Koki, please. Thanks, Desko. So in this slide, in, in this slide and next slide, I'm going to present uh, frequency of activities used in those classes. And next slide, I'm going to talk about the effectiveness of the activities uh, at the bottom songs to pair work. So uh, maybe when we take a look at this chart, uh, you, we can divide this whole uh, activities in two groups. From songs to quick writes, uh, you can see the uh, a little bit lower usage of uh, those activities. You can perceive that. Uh, but on the right side, uh, as the blue arrow shows, the uh, gram from grammar exercise to pair work, which are uh, the activities commonly used by our teachers. Um, so going to the next, Colin, please. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. Um, so um, this is a slide that showing the effectiveness of specific activities. So we use Likert scale from one to five to show uh, very, not very effective to very effective. So one is not very effective and the five is very effective. But on the other hand, we, uh, there are some students, uh, we imagine that there are some activities that were not used in those classes. So we ask those students to click on N slash A, not available, uh, if they thought they didn't use those activities in the courses. So as you remember, the blue arrow shows the most frequently used activities in our courses, but I can click on uh, the button, Colin, but grammar exercise and questions in the textbooks are not somehow perceived as effective uh, as other uh, activities in the same category. So these are the findings that we have found in this survey. Thanks, Colin. So, uh, by taking a look at the uh, most frequently used activities and effective, uh, most effective activities, we created two categories, which are uh, most effective and least effective. So as you can see, the, uh, on the most effective side, we can see mostly production activities um, from presentation, pale work, paragraph writing, uh, discussions. Uh, on the other hand, least effective activities are songs, games, and grammar exercise sometimes. So the, the 
as you can see, speaking is most effective, uh, even C level students, they thought that speaking activities is too much. Uh, they reported that speaking activities is too much, but uh, as you can see, they see that it is effective activity. Um, so uh, writing, writing activities are perceived as uh, effective activities throughout uh, upper level students, C level and D level students. But this has a little bit uh, confrontation of the reports that they made in pr prior section that they reported they want to do daily conversation in the courses, but they perceived the effectiveness of writing uh, paragraph writing or doing uh, essay writing. So across the board, as you can see, the songs are described as least effective activity. Okay, thank you, Colin. So here are the, uh, maybe we can use this as the baseline for to perceive our effectiveness, our courses. So if this question, we use Likert scale uh, zero to 10. Uh, have you, in this question we ask, do you think your uh, English ability have improved or not? Please uh, score that uh, from zero to 10. And as you can see, a level and B level students reported that 6.6, 6.4. So that is probably okay uh, perceived development. But from C level to D level, they reported that their English level uh, is imp has improved much. Okay, so so appropriateness of the textbook. We have asked our students if the usage of the textbook or textbook itself are effective or not from zero to 10 again. Uh, so as you can see, the mean score suggests 6.6. .6. It's not very great score as we can see. So we can think about uh, think, things to change our textbook, which are more aligned to Sefer based in the future. So pilot study survey implications. So what we compiling the data and survey results we have got so far, what we can say from here is that uh, perf students perceive the, uh, a lot of preferences for daily English, uh, even not even C level and D level students. And this is kind of conflict with teacher preferences as Colin presented our teachers thought that A level and C level students, uh, sorry, C level and D level students, upper level students, maybe should be taught academic English, but the student's reaction is a little bit different here. So number two is frequency and perceived effectiveness is all, uh, almost matched together, except textbook usage and grammar activities. Maybe these are the activities that we think about in, uh, changing the way implemented in our courses. So um, as I reported, as Tesco reported, students thought that speaking is too much in C-level classes, but uh, as the results show, they perceived our speaking activities are highly effective. So number four, um, so writing, as I said, B to C-level students perceived these activities are effective. Um, number five is we, as I talked just before, but we can use those results of students' perception on their English development levels as a baseline for future uh, references when we implement more CIFR aligned curriculum. Colin, can you forward? Sorry. Okay, so number six, so for our future, what, what are we gonna do? How we change our survey? How, when we implement interview questions, what can we do? So number one, um, we should include, uh, increase, uh, sorry, include daily English activities. It is not clearly defined, and I perceive a second language learner, probably daily English is the most difficult uh, situation or kind of English to be uh, learned and maybe we should include more concrete activities for daily English. Uh, B, most 
we should include reading activities too. We, as I took a look at the survey uh, questions, I didn't really find the questions related to reading activities. So this is these are something that we have to include in future surveys. Uh, C, uh, we should have clear definition of each activities. Uh, for example, role play is a good example. Uh, it is not clearly defined. When I ask role play, what do you imagine? Probably there will be three types or four types of uh, categories you can think about for role play. So we need to have more clear definition for each activity. Um, and the last one is uh, we need to modify our content of the survey align with CIFAR. So these are the things that we haven't, we can include in the future surveys and interviews. Thanks, Colin. Uh, okay, so I think we'll just go straight to any uh, comments that you have, seeing as how we went way over time. So yeah, does anybody like to make a comment or? Yes, sir, Jean-Pierre, is it? Yeah, that's right. So yeah, that was really brilliant and I really appreciate the opportunity to listen to this. Um, the university I work at, I'm beginning to push for the initiation of a similar project. I'm just wondering though about the 10 point scale you use for overall of course effectiveness. I mean, are learners really able to differentiate between the various steps on that scale? Like what's the difference between a five and a six or what's the difference between a six and a seven? Like, so why that broad scale of it? Why not a five point scale or six? Any, any reason why you did that? Koki, let's go. Good question. Um, why did we use five, 10 point scale? <laughs> That's a really good question. So one thing, the, the thing we tried to avoid was to um, give, you know, very conventional one point uh, one through five Likert scale because students tend to choose three and that's been reported in many literatures. But to answer another um, part of your question, would students understand the uh, difference between 0.5 and 0.6. We're not really sure about that. So that's another thing that we need to uh, discuss. Adding on to what you just asked, we are not really sure if, well, if even when we give five point liquid scale, whether students understand the interval, we're not really sure about. So you just read our minds. <laughs> so that, that will be the answer I could give. Anything else to add, Colleen or Koki? No, that's good for me. <laughs> is that okay, Jean-Pierre? So this is a pilot study and there are a lot of uh, modifications that we need and definitely I we will include your comments uh, for our future references. Thanks, uh, Jean-Pierre. Um, and, and Noriko has a question about learners needs. Yes. Noriko Nagai. Ian too. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much for your very uh, nice presentation. I have um, questions about learner needs. Uh, it is, of course, important for us to listen to learners' needs uh, from their point of view. But at the same time, we have to prepare them for the uh, society and the world they will be born. And in the CEPFAL, uh, when they talk about learners' needs, I think they will present from the both perspectives. In other words, we really have to think about how they use the target language and what they need to be able to do. So even if they want to improve their daily conversation, we really have to think about um, when and how and under what situation after graduation they will use English or whatever the target language. And we have to prepare for that and that's another important thing we educators should think about not only listen to learners uh, own needs mm -hmm. their voices but also we have to prepare uh, their future and we can anticipate what they need to learn and what they are able to do in certain situations what do you think Thanks, Nariko. Um, me and Colin did a different research before, and we targeted our uh, graduate uh, master's, master's students who graduated from our graduate school. 
and we targeted probably uh, uh, we interviewed those students and if they use English their workplaces so basically their needs was TOEIC English test preparation because they have to take like pro, uh, promotion tests and uh, English test slash uh, TOEIC test is used as a benchmark to uh, for the promotion so definitely there's a need for test prep mm. yeah <laughs> That's a, yeah, that's a kind of difficult, difficult, difficult question. Like when I talk with people in Europe, of course in Europe they use English uh, uh, workplace, whereas in Japan they will not use English so much. But who knows in the near future, especially under this situation, we are really um, promoting communication globally, and I, I, I. Do understand um, very difficult. Um, it's very difficult where to focus on, but I think in the future we really have to think about other elements as well. Uh, for instance, AI is improving so much. So, like daily conversation can be really done by um, whatever the software, and we may not be able to do that anymore. So. It's a difficult time to think about what learners need to uh, be able to do with that target language, but it's really interesting to hear what learners really want to do and uh, what we want them to learn. There is a certainly conflict. Thank yeah. you. Yes. If I may jump in, so our school is really interesting. We have this like core value of humanistic approach so uh, sooner or later, we should, the, the CEFR alignment project and the humanistic approach uh, research should merge in the next five, 10 years. And also because we have a lot of different faculties, their needs are quite different. So we need to, uh, as you mentioned, Noriko, dig into what students really mean by daily conversation. Are they uh, foreseeing the conversation between patients and nurses if they're in, uh, nursing department, so on and so forth. So your question was quite intriguing to me. Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, I think it's really uh, yeah interesting question, actually, what the students meant. So, you know, with this pilot survey, we haven't done any interviews, and I think that's something we really need to flesh out what the students actually mean. But because there's that massive contradiction where the most effective uh, activities in class uh, tend to be the ac uh, academic writing was, was very high up on the things that they considered most effective. So big contradiction there that we really need to flesh out in interviews and the, the next uh, survey. So thank you very much though, Nonika. You have a question from Ian and Ellen. Yeah. Maybe uh, we should move on. Ian, let's go. Oh uh, yeah, uh, thank you. I, and also uh, thank you, uh, Noriko Sensei, because uh, that uh, related to one of the other questions I had. So uh, that's that's nice to hear um, some responses on that. Um, I, I quickly, if I could, two questions. When you were asking about the uh, textbooks within your survey, you mentioned that uh, you were asking students about the usage and the level of the textbook. Uh, for the effectiveness, uh, how did you distinguish in the questions between the, the 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 level of the textbooks effectiveness and the usage of the textbooks uh, effectiveness? And um, on a, a secondary question, and I think this relates to something in the comments uh, as well, uh, for leveling students into the classes, uh, did they take the TOEIC initially? to be placed within uh, the different levels of the classes. The, the one thing that we found, the program that I currently work at had used the TOEIC as a placement tool before, uh, which kind of creates a ceiling effect um, uh, because of the, the more specialized vocabulary, business, English nature of the TOEIC. Uh, and that kind of runs a little bit counter to some elements of the SEFR. So, I would say that's one thing that we've been working on is trying to develop more of a placement test that can align with some of those other issues. And I didn't know if your program was working towards something along those lines too. Uh, thank you. I think the second question, the answer is just yes. So all of the students must take 
TOEIC and that's used for um, assigning them to different levels. Uh, and that's, that's mandated by the university. I don't think that's ever going to change because they're very highly invest, invested in the TOEIC. But um, yeah, we, we really need to consider how to, how to um, uh, what's that sort of align the, the SEFRA ideals with the TOEIC requirements of the university. So I don't know if there's an easy answer for that one. Uh, but the question about the textbooks, I don't think we asked about the level of the textbook, did we? we? We asked about the textbook for different levels, the A, B, C, D, but we didn't actually ask them about was it the textbook level appropriate? We just asked them, do you like the textbook? Ah, sorry for my misunderstanding there. That's okay, no problem. Um, so Ellen's got a question there. Um, I answered it back in the chat box. Oh, did you? Okay. Okay. Are there any questions we haven't answered, Ellen? You have listed a few questions over here. Um, the length of the syllabus. Uh, yeah, I was interested in, you know, whether the simplify, whether the syllabi got dumbed down in a way, and also whether they expand or expanded in length to be really huge. But Tetsuko has kind of answered it, and so it sounds like it's quite a valuable process that it would get longer and then shorter. But well, I'd be interested to hear about it. Yeah, I think Ellen, I, I think it is a bit unwieldy, to tell you the truth. I think it did get quite long. They were already too long and they're still very long. So what I want to do is, um, is to really make the, the, the syllabi much more user-friendly, shorter, briefer. But then we, we need to publish some, some guidebooks. I, I've, I've read that some other universities have, uh, what was it, uh, Kandai? Uh, yeah. was an article about how they've developed a, a, a guidebook on the... Oh. Uh, levels and how, how it works with all the different courses. That looks like a brilliant idea. And I think that's one of the very important ways forward where we can kind of summarize the courses, but then have a, a reference book that students and teachers can both go to and look for different um, uh, can do statements, lessons, activities that fit with those statements. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, that's a very good question and, and something that needs to be one of the documents that we need to develop, not in terms of documents, but you know, some of the, um, some of the tools we need to move forward with to make this really um, workable uh, in, in the classroom and user-friendly for teachers and students. Yeah, good point. I just shared a search engine of our syllabus. Uh, it's open for everybody. So if you want uh, interested in, you can type in English too and you can see our syllabus. Whoa. Yeah, I, I've shared that on the, um, on the handout, uh, basically our, our PowerPoint slides. There's a link also for that. Great. Slide I'll share with you. Uh, so it is about time. Hmm. Uh, I have to ask. So please, I will ask all participants to unmute themselves or you can turn on your camera and give the presenters uh, uh, um, support for their presentation. Thank you for their everybody for coming. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Yes. I will stop recording now. Huh? Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, ho hopefully we'll be able to keep in contact with uh, with the SIG in particular and get a lot more.